annexation. So I want to bring this up because there are reports that what President Trump plans to do to end that conflict is to potentially um, push Ukraine to give up Crimea, parts of Donbass. Uh, if that is the plan, do you agree with that strategy? And would that be reporting, uh, rewarding Putin in order to wrap this thing up in the way that he intended to start it and take some of that territory? Is that just giving him what he wanted? Well, Shannon, President Trump and his campaign has said that any reports of plans like that are not authorized and they're not coming from the president himself. Furthermore, President Trump has said that he strongly supports Ukraine's strength and survival. He had a strong relationship when he was in office with President Zelensky. President Trump is the one that provided Ukraine the weapons they needed to fend off this Russian invasion that happened in large part because of Joe Biden's weakness. I don't think President Trump wants to prejudge what the situation will be come January, nor do I, in part because we have no idea how much worse Joe Biden can screw things up. We have to judge the circumstances as they exist next year when he returns to office and hopefully, hopefully when we have a Republican majority in Congress as well to make decisions about what best protects America's interest and the interest of our allies and partners. I'm totally confused. This Fox News Sunday interview that Tom Cotton has uh, just done, it's like parallel universe because Trump clearly has said things about Ukraine and Russia which totally 100% contradict what Tom Cotton actually has said. Uh, the other day he did an interview on Fox, they cut out what he was implying that he would do for day one. Uh, Chris Christie has underlined it very, very clearly. So uh, just a quick question for you. Can anybody sum up in the comment section below, Tom Cotton in one word. Thank you. On, on one key issue, Donald Trump says he'll fix the Ukraine war in 24 hours. Yeah, I know how he'll do it. He'll bend over like he always does to Vladimir Putin and hand him Ukraine. Uh, because he thinks he's a terrific person and an honest guy. This guy who is an authoritarian dictator who has invaded a, f a neighbor with artillery and killing innocent people and taking their land by force. This is the guy Donald Trump calls a terrific person. Let me flip the... So when you want to talk about misinformation, Mr. Snyder, you might actually look a little closer to American media if you don't like what they're saying. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, does he have the opportunity to respond to the gentlelady? Sure. Yeah. I didn't ask him a okay. question, no, her Mr. Raskin. You asked right. multiple questions. First of all, I'd like to thank the representative from Georgia by making clear with her comments and with her person that any discussion of political warfare has to include Russia, Ukraine, and America. Um, she's just demonstrated that point, I think, very powerfully. On the question of Nazis, I've written, written two books as a historian about Nazis and the Holocaust. On the question of Ukrainian nationalism, I am the leading scholar of that subject in North America and have been writing about it for 20 years. If the chamber is interested in the degree of far-right participation in Ukrainian politics, you can be assured that no far-right no far -right party has ever crossed 3% 3% in Ukrainian election. So, of course, there are bad people in every country, but by any comparative standard is a very small phenomenon. In Russia, on the other hand, the army includes openly Nazi formations, such as Rusic. The government itself is fascist in character, and it is carrying out a war which includes deportation of children by the tens of thousands, the open intention of destroying a state, as well as mass torture. So if we're looking for fascism, and if there is anyone who is sincerely concerned about halting fascism or racism, you would wish to halt Russia. Also, demanding no more money for Ukraine. That is the right thing to do, and it also obeys the majority of the majority. Um, You've been probably one of the most ardent backers of Ukraine in the Senate here, but what took so long to get some of these other eight Republicans persu persuaded to your position there? Was it the overall nature of this bill and what was lost yeah. in that time period for Ukraine? Well, that's a good question. You already know the answer. I, I think the demonization of Ukraine began by Tucker Carlson who, in my opinion, ended up where he should have been all along, which is interviewing Vladimir Putin. And so he had an enormous audience, which convinced a lot of rank-and-file Republicans that maybe this was 
a mistake. I think the former uh, president had sort of mixed views on it. We all felt the border was a complete disaster, myself included. And Chad, you remember covering the phases we went through. First, there was an effort to make law, which requires you to deal with Democrats. And then a number of our members thought it wasn't good enough. And then our nominee for president didn't seem to want us to do anything at all. That took months to work our way through it. So we ended up doing the supplemental that was originally proposed, which dealt with not all problems, it didn't solve the border problem, but certainly addressed the growing threats at the moment. It doesn't bother me. Has it bothered you? Has there been blowback on Barron because he's younger and yeah. more vulnerable? It's not easy. And he's a great kid. He's a good student. He's, you know, got accepted to different colleges. He's got his, some of those colleges, all of a sudden, they're riding all over the place. You know, you're saying, but he's a good boy. He's a tall boy. Very he tall. He's very tall. And, and he's a great kid. He's a good-looking kid. And, uh, you know, he's going to be going to college. But he doesn't say it. And I think he doesn't say because he doesn't want to hurt me. You know, he thinks it's a possibly a hurtful conversation. But it has to affect my family. And I think that's really unfair because I have a very good family. I have good kids. I have a wonderful wife. I mean, it's not easy for her to read this kind of stuff that's fake, that's, to that's fake stuff. And But that's the way it is. Uh, it certainly is not a good thing. And... It, yeah, it affects me more than it would if it were just about me. I wish it could be just about me. How's she holding up through all of this? I think good, but I don't think it's an easy thing for her. And I think if it wasn't good, she wouldn't want to tell me about it, to be honest with you, because, you know, she sees that I'm fighting like hell. I'm trying to become president and make America great again. That's what we're going to do. We're going to make America great again. They put tremendous obstacles in our way, including the 20 million people that are going to be in here by the time this guy gets out. It's an election we have to win. We're not going to have a country left if we don't win this election. Yeah, but that quest to push disinformation and misinformation doesn't happen just in our law schools. It's happening in Congress, and it leaves the heavy lifting to people like you and other Democrats in Congress to stop gap the lies. Is there anything that can be done, though, to stop what happened, for example, this week with Dr. Fauci in Congress? Is there anything to do to make sure that doesn't happen in the halls of Congress? Well, you know, the party of uh, democracy and the party of freedom and the party of truth has just got to be tough. And I think Dr. Fauci modeled that toughness uh, this week when, um, you know, and he's not a partisan actor, but he's just a scientist. And he just said that this is nonsense and this is preposterous. I mean, I had, you know, Republican colleagues and there are right wing commentators who are out there saying that Dr. Fauci created the COVID-19 mm -hmm. Um, virus in order to make money off of it, and they were charging him with uh, profiting somehow off of COVID-19, and he refuted that definitively and uh, shut them down. But like I told Dr. Fauci at the hearing, they were treating him like a convicted felon, and then I had to correct myself. I said, no, actually, they treat convicted felons much better than they treat doctors who have devoted their entire lives to saving people's lives. And, you know, if you look at Dr. Fauci's record, not just on COVID-19, but uh, HIV, AIDS, the, the, uh, the Zika virus, a whole bunch of other diseases. He has saved hundreds of thousands of lives through his work as a doctor, a scientist, and a medical leader. And yet, the, all they could do was beat him up. And then, meantime, they're running around the country trying to excuse an adjudicated sexual assailant, an adjudicated fraudster, and a convicted felon who was just found guilty by a jury of 12 peers chosen by both sides in the trial of having paid $130,000 in hush money to his porn star mistress and then cooking the books to engage in more financial fraud. And that's the person who's defining their party. All right, should it be zero tolerance? The reason I say that, and they're talking about Supreme Justice, is Clarence Thomas and the Nita have had millions, I repeat, millions of dollars of freebies and goodies and all sorts of uh, nice little... Hmm, 
uh, brown envelopes, I suppose you could call them, Google that, whereas Katanji Brown Jackson is being castigated, you may find this a bit weird, by uh, Fox & Co for accepting free Beyonce tickets. So Alito and Thomas have had millions and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of uh, stuff for being in the SCOTUS position. Fox don't say anything because, well, I actually don't know why, but uh, how dare Katanji Brown Jackson go to a Beyonce ticket? Outrageous. So should there be zero tolerance? If you're a Supreme Justice, should there be nothing? Hmm. The point here, which is that the Supreme Court is self-policing. And just they just got an ethics code after all of these controversies within the last year. Um, lower courts have to operate on one of those. Really, oversight comes from Congress. Uh, but right now we have divided government. Republicans control the House and the Senate, of course, uh, is controlled by Democrats. So what options are there to provide oversight to the Supreme Court at this point? They are really few, especially, as you say, in a time of divided government. It's basically politics. So we have this current brouhaha with Justice Alito. He has written to the Congress, nobody could reasonably question my impartiality that the flag was flying. You know, think about it for a moment. Say you were involved in a gay rights case. You were on the other side and you pass a just judge's house and the gay pride flag is flying. Might you, might you think reasonably that person won't be impartial? Of course you might, but it's only now to Justice Alito say so. And it will remain that way. The only real thing a Congress can do is kind of shine a light on it in individual instances. But even this uh, new code, it will be to them. There, there are essentially no tools. I know there's talk on the Hill and they sh should they can have hearings and investigate. But short of impeachment, there are very few tools to actually um, force the Supreme Court to hew to its own, not just its own, the, the code of ethics that every judge, federal judge, uh, complies with in the federal system. Right. It's a you, problem. Yeah, you brought up Justice Samuel Alito. I do want to ask you yeah. specifically about, about him. A former neighbor of his is questioning the justice's explanation for that upside down American flag that you mentioned that was seen flying at his Virginia home. Uh, in 2021. And in, and you mentioned the letter that he wrote to lawmakers. He said it was in response to, quote, a very nasty neighborhood dispute. But the neighbor said this. We can listen. At best, he's mistaken. But at worst, he's just outright lying. The interaction that happened on February 15th is the one that they're using as an excuse for why they flew the flag. And I really want to hammer home um, the fact that that happened on February 15th, and their flag went up two or three weeks before that. So that neighbor saying that the timeline is incorrect that he's put out there, do you think that Justice Alito misled or lied to Congress in his explanation of events? And, and more broadly, people will say, oh, what about this flag thing? What is it? Why does it matter that we're talking about this? Why does it matter that this happened with a Supreme Court justice? So let's start there. The flag was understood at the time. This is just after January 6th as, as a stop the steal, uh, uh, you know, blazing statement. So why would it matter that a Supreme Court justice in, who might have to sit on January 6th cases, but even beside that, would be asserting there is a steal going on of the election, among other reasons, because it's false. There was no steal going on, but also because it's such a sign of partisanship that you would certainly question their their uh, ability to be impartial. And Alito himself has distanced it, himself from it, which is an implicit understanding that if he himself were flying the flag, it would be a problem. Now, as to this discrepancy, the neighbor says that there is material evidence. We have a picture in the New York Times in January and a police report uh, at the altercation in February, which Justice Alito says triggered it. Look, I can't, I'm not saying that the neighbor's word should be taken over that of a justice of the United States. However, um, there is the discrepancy, and the and I really think it's it's uh, essential to get to the bottom of it. If it's the case, I am not saying it's the case, but if it is that Justice Alito sent a letter to the Congress and didn't tell the truth in it, 
that is exceptionally grave. I think that would be an impeachable offense. And right. what, of course, that might not go forward in the current climate. But even so, that prospect really requires that the that the Senate or that oversight in the Congress that you get to the bottom of it. There are material discrepancies. It's enough to have a hearing and look into it. All right, Harry Lippman, thank you so much. Thank you. A lot more news.